All right, great. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Susan Weinrich, and I'm going to be walking you through today's presentation. Um, just want to do a few housekeeping items. Uh, there is a chat feature to Zoom, as you may know. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type into the chat box and we'll try to address your questions um, throughout the presentation. Anastasia will be monitoring that um, and I'll be trying to respond. Otherwise, at the end of the session, we'll definitely have some additional time for some uh, Q&A and discussion. Um, so the, I believe that this session is going to be recorded. So um, you will be receiving a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and some additional resources, uh, as well as a link to the recording, I believe, um, after the session. So with that, I will just say, um, for those of you who may not know, the DIPSNY program is the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York. And uh, it's a five-year initiative really designed to deliver collections-related training, preservation surveys, archival assessments, and other services to the historical records community in New York. So that includes things like strategic planning and trainings like this um, one that we're working on today on board committees. Hopefully some of you have also had the chance to participate in uh, the other governance series workshops that we have done throughout this month. If you have not, they should be available to you on the DIPSNY website. So you can take a look there as well. Um, my, as I mentioned, my name is Susan Weinrich and I work with the New York Council of Nonprofits. We are the State Association of Nonprofits. We have about 3,000 members um, of all kinds. So we work with a lot of arts and cultural organizations, museums. We work with health and human services organizations, uh, housing, economic development, social services, you name it. Um, and provide a wide variety of cost saving and group purchasing um, programs for nonprofits. We have attorneys and fiscal folks on staff, and we also have you know, folks like myself who do consulting around governance and strategic planning um, and uh, sort of fundraising and um, needs assessments and program planning and, and all of those kinds of things. So if you're not members of Nikon, please, check out our website and hopefully you can join us. In terms of today's session, what we're gonna do is to really talk about um, looking at the role of committees. And we'll talk about how committees fit within your organizational structure, um, how to think about them in terms of your board. We're gonna talk about how to build an effective and efficient committee structure, recognizing that um, there's probably some variety among the participants. We've got a couple of polls that we're gonna do so we can get a sense of who is on the call as well, whether you have staff, how large your organization is, how big your board is, um, and how many committees you have. So um, we want to talk about how you can really think about using your committees to engage your board and also your membership. Committees can be a really great resource for engaging people and strengthening the relationships with them, leveraging their knowledge and expertise and time. Um, and it can also be a great way of um, really recruiting potential new board members and also keeping uh, board members who might term off involved and engaged and keeping their expertise and experience involved in the organization. We wanna talk a little bit about committee chairs uh, and really their importance as leadership roles within the organization. They are one of the uh, least supported leadership roles in organizations and so um, we'll talk about how to support them and to keep them really, you know, involved and, and have the information that they need to do an effective job 
And then we'll just talk in summary about some best practices around board committee roles. All right, so just an FYI, uh, I'm not an attorney and this isn't legal advice and uh, you know, it's general information, but if you have specific issues or questions, particularly related to bylaws and other legal things, uh, please, you know, make sure you get direct advice. Okay, so I'm going to launch a poll here um, and I want to give you a few minutes to get a sense of how many paid staff does your organization have? Um, and uh, also, what is your annual budget? This will give us a sense of who we've got in the room. In the Zoom room, anyway. Okay. All right, so just one more minute, another couple of seconds and uh, We'll give you a chance. All right, and then we'll we'll report on that. So it looks like we have a really even distribution among organizations in terms of staff. Um, about 13% don't have any staff at all. 17% uh, just have one staff person, and then 23% each, uh, or about seven people, have two to four, five to nine, or ten or more. So that's good to know. Um, and then in terms of your annual budget, you know, some of you are, are really small, under $100,000. Some of you are between the $250,000. So um, a good number of you are under the, uh, the threshold for having a financial review. And then we've got um, a good number kind of in the middle section there between 250 and 750 and then just a couple over 750,000 or a million. So thank you for that. Uh, I guess I'll just share the results there. I couldn't tell. So this is, the, this is how things break down for you to be able to see um, pretty evenly distributed. All right. Um, so in terms of that, you know, I, I just, um, I want to say that ultimately what we're working on and the reason we have committees and the reason we're thinking about this is so that you can build this organizational structure that leverages the knowledge and the skills and the, the capacity of the people who are involved. And ultimately when you're building an effective structure, what you really want to think about is how to clearly define the decision making, monitoring, and reporting responsibilities at board and management levels so that you know who's responsible for what, who makes what decisions, who's accountable to whom, and in what ways, right? So essentially you're creating your organizational communication flow and you're helping people understand what different groups, whether it's committees or the full board or staff or work committees, work groups, um, what they're responsible for. So um, this is just a, a visual here that might be helpful. I find it really useful because if you think about the role of the board, the board ultimately is really responsible for policy making, for strategy development and for organizational oversight. And then you have staff and volunteers uh, who are responsible for the implementation with the executive director really having responsibilities related to policy making strategy and oversight and also implementation. And there are shared responsibilities. And in many ways, this is kind of like an accordion. Different organizations function very differently. Most of you who are small organizations, many of the board members probably function as a large number of staff and volunteers. Maybe you function as docents, maybe you're helping to plan events or programs, um, you know, or, or the gala or dinner or something like that. So 
the, the, the diagram on the left is kind of the conventional organizational model, but in reality, most smaller organizations look more like that um, three-dimensional one on the right, where the board has the responsibility for its governance functioning, right? But in many ways, it's also, um, you know, functioning as management and as staff and volunteers, and there's an overlap there. And I think when we're talking about committees, one of the things that I'll be trying to emphasize throughout this session is just really thinking about when are your committees working as a sort of subset of the board of directors in its governance capacity? When is it really functioning as a either instead of an executive director or perhaps in collaboration with the executive director or management of the organization? And when are board members really taking on the role of volunteer staff? Um, because that really speaks to um, the accountability mechanisms that you're going to build in and also speaks to some of the challenges that organizations have related to committee structures where the day-to-day -day committees take over, you know, that bigger picture of policy and strategy um, and oversight and people get lost in the weeds of you've got a program coming up. You've got an event coming up. So I just want to kind of frame it that way. Just another uh, couple of slides for all volunteer organizations. Um, because I think this is, is also really important. And again, it may be true in some of the organizations that do have some paid staff. Um, that the board really functions in its governance ca capacity and its action is functions as a collective body. Individual board members don't have any authority or you know, um, discretion outside of the collective body of the board in a governing capacity. In a managing capacity, the board can appoint either an individual or several individuals to carry on some management or oversight function of various activities. It might be program related, it might be fundraising related, event specific, um, it couldn't relate to facilities management, uh, it might be a volunteer, um, you know, sort of uh, archivist, for instance, um, who's really managing the archival process for your organization. And then you've got volunteers who are serving really as individuals at the guidance of a manager. And the manager also, like, it may be an individual, but it might also be a committee. You might assign an executive committee uh, or a fundraising committee as an oversight management body for a particular activity. So just a couple of different ways of thinking about this. Um, but here's another slide and we won't go into it in detail, but it really helps to kind of clarify what are those big picture issues in terms of governance and leadership versus management functions for all volunteer organizations. So, um, you know, really thinking about how you, when we're de designing a committee process, think about delineating these activities around, you know, financial oversight and making sure you're legally compliant, you've got safety and regulatory compliance and contractual compliance, um, making sure that the board is thinking strategically about the future of the organization uh, and is accountable to its donors and funders uh, and other constituencies, um, you know, and really kind of make sure that you're keeping new board members engaged in that process so that um, you don't just become a small group that whittles away and then there's no organization that's larger than the sum of the parts. Um, when it comes to those management functions, really we're talking about when it is you're getting work done. It's the, what I call the operational components. They may relate to programs. 
They may relate to the archival responsibilities. They may relate to fundraising activities. Um, management is really about supporting and engaging your other volunteers so that you're increasing organizational capacity, so that you're serving as ambassadors to the community, um, and that you really are, you know, kind of providing leadership and engaging new people and passing along the torch of organizational commitment. So um, I think this is useful both for, you know, all volunteer organizations, but also for all boards to think about the different roles that they're playing um, in getting the, the work done, particularly smaller organizations. A couple of key terms and concepts uh, that I just want to throw out, um, and these are really just for conceptual understanding um, and, and sort of how I'm framing certain things, which is if you think about a, you know, a standing committee, right? A standing committee would be a permanent committee that meets regularly to accomplish the work of the organization. In large part, we're talking about the governance work of the organization, but many organizations have much more operational standing committees as well. And these are really the core ones that need to happen to focus on some of those higher level policy and strategy and oversight responsibilities such as finance or uh, what we would say board development or governance or fundraising, um, maybe collections or programming. Ad hoc committees are temporary, right? They may be cyclical. You may have an annual ad hoc committee to evaluate your executive director or a periodic ad hoc strategic planning committee um, to address a particular issue or accomplish a single task. A task force is usually a time delineated group of experts who are designed to you know, come together to accomplish a single or discrete task. And then a work group uh, I would say is a group of people that are dedicated to accomplishing certain goals or activities or functions, but that they're not ongoing in an organizational way. Right. It may be fundraising. It may be about a particular event or a particular program, or it may be program related to support those activities or fundraising related, but it may not rise to the level of a sort of standing strategic organizational committee. I also want to just define ex officio because I think it gets confusing for people when it comes to appointing people um, to ex, ex officio members of a committee or the board. And ex officio means by position, right? So you need to specify whether somebody who might be serving on a committee in an ex officio capacity is doing so as a voting member or a non-voting member. Same is true on the board. For, for instance, or on an honorary committee. And then I just, another little piece of, of information is to remind you that when, uh, it, you know, if you're following kind of Robert's rules or parliamentary procedure, when a committee makes a motion for action to the board, it does not need to be seconded because the motion comes from the committee. And if the committee has already voted to move it to the board, it has had a motion, it has had a second, and it has been supported and therefore is a, you know, a sort of formal um, uh, part of the board's decision making process. And my reason for sharing this is one, just to sort of set the stage and make sure that we're all in agreement, but also to encourage you to think about, you know, <sighs> Many organizations, and this is particularly true of museums or historical associations and largely volunteer organizations, have many standing committees that kind of overwhelm the organization. And so an organization might have seven standing committees or, um, you know, or seven board members and 11 standing committees or vice versa, right? And that's just not sustainable. That's not viable 
uh, in any long term way. And so there's different ways of thinking about the, the type of work and when it needs to happen. And I think expanding our vocabulary around committees can be really helpful to making people feel like they're not expected to serve on four committees, that you've got enough people at um, the table that you can think about involving non-board members perhaps in some of the organization's work um, and that you can just, you know, sort of have a, a variety of tools in your toolbox. So ultimately, when it comes to committees, really you're talking about establishing committees when it's apparent that issues are too complex or too numerous to be handled by the entire board. Right. If your board meetings are super long and there's too many people trying to weigh in on too many issues, you're not going to be effective and you're not going to be efficient. People are going to get frustrated. They're not going to have the opportunity to participate in meaningful ways. And so committees really give people the opportunity to contribute their expertise, their time, um, to get a diversity of opinions and do a much deeper dive. And committees really perform the due diligence functions of the board. So, you know, certainly if you think about a finance committee, the finance committee might work with staff to develop and propose an annual budget, to review financial performance, to uh, recommend an investment policy to the board of directors um, or to develop a collections policy if it's a collections committee right it does that due diligence it does a deep dive it gathers information it evaluates the options and hopefully makes recommendations back to the board of directors committees only have the authority prescribed to them and limited by the board. So no committee has more authority or oversight than the full board, including the executive committee. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that, that the board can really prescribe and limit the, board, the committee's roles. And then committees really do provide an opportunity to engage experts or stakeholders in different ways. So you can increase the participation for your organization. You can use it to perhaps recruit and uh, engage new prospective board members um, and also tap into people who don't necessarily want to make the commitment of serving on the board either now or ever, um, or maybe they've done their board service, but they want to stay involved. So they're a useful tool for engaging people and tapping into the variety of expertise and skills that you might have available to you. Um, one of the things I just want to suggest is that standing committees are defined in your bylaws. That there are different theories about bylaws. Some attorneys feel like committees or bylaws should be very minimalist. Uh, that if you're, you know, that if you're not functioning, you're, if your committees aren't functioning well, you're therefore violating your bylaws, and therefore there's a problem, and so you shouldn't put things in your bylaws. Um, our approach at Nikon is that your bylaws are an important tool for everyone to understand how the work gets done in your organization. So we really suggest that you've got the key committee responsibilities and composition of those committees in your bylaws, they're documented and they're reviewed by everyone. And that if you are changing your committee structure on an annual or periodic basis, you know, you can certainly change those committee descriptions or remove certain committees or restructure your committees and change your bylaws. Um, one thing you want to do is define committees of the board or committees of the corporation. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but committees of the board are those that can act or bind the board, such as an executive committee and a finance and audit committee. 
whereas committees of the corporation are really those that um, you know, are not able to act instead of the board, but that focus on accomplishing certain goals of the board or the organization. Define your committees as standing or ad hoc, right? That an ad hoc strategic planning committee will be established every three to five years in order to help the organization develop a strategic plan or an ad hoc personnel committee will be established to evaluate the executive director on a periodic basis. Um, you want to define your committees, and this is where the language can be particularly helpful, as whether they are advisory to staff or accountable to the board of directors. And this is going back to that slide that distinguishes um, the work of the, the board from operational responsibilities to governance responsibilities. Um, and so really thinking about them, and again, if you don't have staff and you're all volunteer, it's a, still a distinction about, are the, is it an operational function or a governance function? You wanna specify on your committee, in your bylaws, whether non-board members can serve on those committees. You wanna specify how committee chairs are appointed and approved, as well as how committee members, both board and non-board members are appointed and approved to your committees. So I would recommend that all committee, that you really think about committees on an annual basis and the appointments are on an annual basis for a term, right, of a year usually, sometimes maybe two, but a year where people can make a year long commitment to do that work and to learn about the organization and to um, help accomplish, you know, that, that year's goals. Um, but because the committees are so important and really help the board accomplish its due diligence, the board should be on record as saying yes, we believe this committee has the people and the knowledge and the expertise that it needs to make good recommendations or carry out good projects for the organization. So I would just say, suggest formalizing that process and really making sure that those committee chairs and committee members understand that the expectation is that they're serving for a one year term. If you have projects which are more event specific, you're developing your annual gala or your annual fundraising event, for instance, um, that aren't you know, year long standing committees ongoing, then you can really think about, is this a task force? Is this a work, um, a work group? in order to do certain things. It's a little bit of a semantical difference, but I think it helps to clarify the level of commitment and time and obligation that is expected of the organization and gives people opportunities to fulfill their commitments in ways that they're comfortable with. So, um, those of you who, um, you know, may remember the New York State uh, revised the not-for-profit corporation law about five years ago. It was actually the end of 2014 at this point, so six years ago. Um, Nonprofit Revitalization Act distinguished between those committees of the board and committees of the corporation that I referenced. Committees of the board can only include voting members of board members, whereas committees of the corporation can include non-board members and can be a really good vehicle for engaging your membership uh, in, a, in a large way. Um, that on committees of the board, board non-board members can only serve uh, in an advisory capacity. Um, and then committees of the board, members are appointed by majority of the board. Um, and so the, the most likely committees, as I said before, are executive or audit and finance. Whereas committees of the corporation, uh, you know, they, the, they can be appointed or elected in the same way as officers, 
So for instance, if your board approves your officers, the board would approve uh, your, the members of your committee, your committees of the corporation. If your officers are approved by membership, then if you don't have a different clause in your bylaws, the people on those committees are appointed uh, you know, by the memberships themselves as well, which is not necessarily uh, the, the best approach. The thing about committees of the corporation is that the law does not specify whether they are accountable to the board, to the membership, or the executive director even. So for instance, a nominating committee that is comprised of members might be actually accountable to the membership rather than the board of directors. Or a program committee might be advisory to the executive director. So part of the thinking is you have some different ways of thinking about your organizational structure. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this. Uh, in terms of the accountability and the, the sort of coordination and oversight, because that goes to also organizational capacity around uh, who takes minutes, who are the chairs, how is information reported at your board meetings, um, and, you know, and how do you make sure that the committees are effective uh, moving forward? How do you make sure that there's a good chairperson running the meetings? So uh, just food for thought around those. Um, okay, so just also to clarify, committees never have more authority than the board. So no committee can ever submit to members any action requiring member approval. It's got to go through the board of directors. No committee can fill vacancies on the board or on committees. No committee can fix compensation of board members or committee members, although it's inadvisable to pay board members. It is not illegal to pay board members. So that's just important to know. No committee can adopt or amend the bylaws or other fundamental corporate changes like changing your charter or your articles of incorporation or selling your assets or anything like that. Uh, and no committee can amend or appeal a board resolution. They can't override anything that is done by the full board of directors. Um, so those are making sure that the limitations should be clear to all of the committees and in your bylaws as well. When you're thinking about the committee authority and committee charge, you want to think about, you know, both in a broad sense, as well as in uh, an assigning way, right? So you may have a standing committee that does a variety of different activities, a, an executive committee may at some point or another perform any of these uh, activities, whereas a uh, a gala committee may really focus on the implementation. Um, so you want to think about what are you asking a committee to do? Are you asking them to collect information, to research something, to collect information and bring it to the board for discussion and decision? Right? Maybe you're looking at revising your collections policy and you want committees to think about a committee to look at the various options and to um, just bring those back to the board? Or are you asking the committee to actually look at a variety of collections policies or revising your current collections policy, uh, analyzing that information and recommending changes to your collections policy to the board or your investment policy if it's a finance committee, for instance? Do you want a committee to implement something, right? So are you asking them to uh, run an educational program series for the season? Are you asking them to run a fundraising event for you? Um, so really thinking about, you know, what you're asking them to do and are you comfortable with them implementing that? Or are you asking them to decide on a course of action 
implement it and then report to the board, right? And I would suggest that for most things, if that's the case, it's probably a committee of the board rather than a committee of the corporation. That the committees of the corporation should seek an approval first um, before they, you know, follow a course of action. So um, I've just got another poll here for you to think about. Uh, and I'm curious, so let's see, whoops. I'm gonna do the second poll, which is how many board members do you have and how many committees do you have? So it's looking like, in terms of the number of board members, most folks have under 16, which is definitely true. Uh, looks like one organization has between 17 and 21. Um, but the, and, and most of you have, almost half have between 8 and 11, 42%. Uh, so, and that's kind of what we're seeing is a trend towards smaller boards. So used to be boards might be, you know, 17 and up, 20 and up, 25 and up. And most organizations, that because of the proliferation of organizations, because of the changes in our economy and people working, both, you know, both, um, you know, partners, they might have a family, it's just, it's harder to have that many people serve. Many organizations, particularly, um, you know, collecting institutions have older boards, and so they struggle with finding younger board members. Um, and then, uh, you know, when it comes to committees, it also looks like, um, I'm gonna share the results with you here, that, so, a, a few of you function essentially as a committee of the whole, where the full board does everything, right? And that's fine. There's no requirement for a board to have committees. Um, again, it goes back to that question of, are you functioning as effectively and efficiently as possible? Um, and then a couple of you have only one to two, and then there's a good number of you that have three or four, uh, you know, so a third of you have between, you know, three to four committees or five and six committees. And then a few of you have, you know, seven or eight or even nine or more committees. So um, that's a lot of committees for some of you. Um, and I think it's definitely worth really thinking about that. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, just the, the organization and, and your capacity. Um, we'll talk about kind of how to think about committees in relationship to the size of your board. When we're talking about a committee structure, the, the typical governance committees that we see are executive, um, you know, which is really often the officers for larger boards, the executive committee may be officers and committee chairs, for instance, um, that the, the finance and audit committee, whether in some organizations just have a finance committee, some organizations have a, an, a, an audit committee or an audit and compliance committee, um, you know, in general, uh, our recommendation is that the general finance and audit responsibilities, you know, should go together, that most organizations don't have the capacity for a totally separate audit committee. The caveat to this being that the Board of Regents requires you to have an ad hoc uh, audit committee, and we'll talk more about that in, in, in a separate function. The function of that is not to necessarily engage with your auditor. If your budget, for instance, is over 
$750,000, you need a full audit. If your budget is between 250 and 750, you need a review. Um, the audit threshold is gonna go up to a million dollars next year. So uh, only really larger organizations will need uh, an actual audit. We strongly recommend that organizations think about having a board development committee. Some organizations call it a governance committee. Some organizations call it a nominating committee. Uh, if you participated in some of the other the workshops, you, you'll understand why that we recommend really thinking about that full cycle of board development from board assessment and planning to nominating and recruiting and orienting and training. And that's why we feel like board development or governance um, kind of captures what the scope of that should be. And then um, many organizations, of course, have a fundraising or maybe a fundraising and marketing committee. Some organizations have what they call a fundraising committee, but it's really more of an event committee. It's focused on the gala or the dinner or other fundraising events. It's not focused on the organization's fundraising policies or strategy or donor development and cultivation. So these are the beginning, and the reason I'm pointing these things out is it kind of begins to get at some of those distinctions between governance related committees and more operational committees or activities. So an event work group or task force as opposed to a fundraising committee that really looks overall at your over, you know, your fundraising strategy, donor development, member development, cultivation, mem membership, uh, you know, corporate sponsorships, whatever it might be. So those, when, when we work with organizations, those are the standard ones. Other organizations have, you know, they may have a program or a mission impact committee. Um, some have a strategic planning committee, either as a standing or an ad hoc committee. Many have a membership committee. If you do have an organizational membership, sometimes that's tied to fundraising. Sometimes it's on its own. Sometimes it's tied to volunteer engagement or marketing. Some organizations have a personnel committee. My opinion is that unless you're super large or unionized, you really don't need a standing personnel committee. That, that's something that, you know, in terms of doing the evaluation of the executive director, for instance, that's something that um, the executive committee can do. They work most closely with the executive committee. To do that, um, you know, to, so, sometimes you may want an ad hoc personnel committee to look at the organizational organizations' um, sort of uh, policies around compensation or benefits or those kinds of things, uh, and then you may, you know, want to change them. Some organizations, healthcare organizations, have a corporate compliance committee, for instance. And then, you know, the blue ones um, on the right there are kind of more of the um, programmatic operational types of committees. So might some organizations have a legislative or government affairs committees. Many collecting institutions, right, have a collections committee. Um, many have, uh, if you have, you know, grant, oops, sorry about that, grounds or landscape or trails committees um, that focus on taking care of the, the grounds themselves. Um, many have a volunteer or docent committee for training docents and volunteers and engaging them and recognizing them. Uh, many organizations have a facilities committee um, or a separate exhibits committee or some have a conference committee, uh, you know, and then different organizations have many, many others depending on, you know, their unique organization. Um, so, you know, I think part of what um, I, I wanted to do is sort of just share with you like this broad conceptual framework of it's possible to have a board of seven people and 15 committees, but 
that's not necessarily sustainable. So part of what I've done with other organizations is just to begin to think conceptually about their organization. So you think about this uh, organizational chart here, for instance. The board governance committees, the, the red, the board has an executive committee and a finance committee that um, are maybe uh, committees of the board, right? They're doing the real governance related work. It's also got a board development committee um, and maybe as an offshoot, it's also got that audit committee that's required by the Board of Regents. Uh, it also might have a resource development committee or a fundraising committee that looks at that big picture fundraising responsibility. How do we engage our donors? How do we reach out to major donors? How do we increase people's contributions from you know, basic membership to larger gifts to planned giving? Um, you know, what's our overall fundraising strategy? In this case, for instance, then you have an, ex in this organization, they have an executive director who, and this is just a conceptual reframing, instead of having a program or collections committee, a facilities committee, and an event planning committee that's accountable to the board, run by the board and board members. They rethought it, and so recognizing that the executive director is responsible for day-to-day -day operations, they need help. Maybe it's a small organization, they don't have a lot of staff, but that they need board members to fun function as volunteers, they need additional volunteers, but that the executive director essentially runs the program and collections advisory group, runs the facility advisory group or work group or whatever you want to call it, an event planning group, um, and coordinates those efforts. And so when you're thinking about, for instance, the reporting at the board meeting, it's the executive director who reports back on programs and collections or facilities or events, it's not board members. And so board members' efforts can focus on many of these other tasks and build leadership and engagement in these ways. They can certainly choose to participate in the programs, collections, facilities, um, or events but that, that those are not the core pieces of responsibility for the board. So this is just one way of looking at this. This is, would be a different way of looking at it, perhaps for an all volunteer or largely volunteer organization, where it's a similar model without the executive director, where the resource development committee does that bigger picture strategy, but then there are event planning task forces and a member development and engagement group, work group or task force, whatever you want to call it, that essentially coordinates with the resource development committee, but um, isn't, you know, isn't kind of a directly governance related task for the board. It needs to happen, but the resource development committee essentially functions as a management role for the event planning task force. So it's just another way of looking at and conceptualizing your organizational structure. And this is another one, you know, for all volunteer organizations even, where you have the executive committee functioning as essentially the executive director, where those committees, the programs and collections and facilities and resource development committee work under the auspices of the executive committee. I think that resource development committee shouldn't, should be a, a, up a level and the event planning and member development um, under that still. But you know, you can play with this just conceptually in terms of coordination so that you're thinking about how uh, either in all volunteers or largely volunteer organizations, 
you distinguish between the governing role and the management role and the implementation roles that need to happen. Um, you know, the other way of doing that is, is a more functional way in terms of your committee agendas, right? Where you are, have to be intentional about incorporating each of those components. What are the governance fundraising committee responsibilities? What are the management fundraising committee responsibilities? And then what are the more operational event specific responsibilities that that committee needs to focus on? And how do you align the agenda so that you're making sure to do all of those things so that the next upcoming event doesn't always take precedent and that you lose out on the strategy component of the work, which essentially really makes up for, uh, you know, makes the, the work that you're doing that much more effective and that much more efficient. Uh, I just included this and I've talked about it um, as I've been having these conversations, but um, the audit committee requirements for chartered institutions is that the board shall appoint a board cons constituted audit committee composed of a minimum of three board members other than the treasurer and president to review the institution's financial interactions, uh, transactions and reports. And it applies to every institution regardless of its size, operating budget, and whether you have a financial review or audit, um, you know, essentially as required by not-for-profit corporation law. So just, you know, I wanted to make sure, call that to your attention. We definitely see many organizations that don't have this and are out of compliance, essentially, with what you're supposed to do. All right, so um, here's just some food, practical food for thought. I um, just wanted to check the chat box. Feel free to add any questions or thoughts or suggestions, or if you've got examples, feel free. Um, otherwise, at the end of the session, we'll, you know, we'll definitely give you the chance. Um, uh, so, you know, I think one thing you should do is think about a maximum of one committee per person. And this is why I asked you the question earlier. If you have nine board members, right, three committees, maybe four, are probably all you should have. That it's really hard to run things, particularly we're talking, you know, about the combined governance and operational responsibilities. Um, so you want to think about that um, or, you know, making sure you're separating out those governance and management functions. You want to also distinguish between the work that people need to do as board members and fiduciaries and that those they can also choose to do as volunteers and members. And the more clear you are on what your expectations are for board members as they relate to board service, the more likely you are to have people, you know, be, choose whether to join the board, whether to work as a volunteer, or whether to do both or neither. Um, I can tell you, you know, I am chair of a board right now, and um, I was the first sort of outsider for, for the organization. And for many, many years, um, most board members were involved in the day-to-day -day operations. They would run programs. Some of them still do. I don't have that time or that energy to, or the expertise, it's not my area, um, to to do the program work. I'm on the board because I believe in the mission and I wanna help strengthen the board. I want to try to help strengthen the fundraising for the organization, um, but I can't run day-to-day -day programs. If that was an expectation that I would not be able to fulfill, I couldn't be a board member, right? So we can find other people who can do the volunteer program work but not necessarily as board members. And I think it's important to think about that. 
think it's also important to think about that within the context of volunteer leadership development, that you might have super volunteers who may or may not be board members. They may be past board members, or they may ultimately be future board members, um, uh, or they, you know, they may be current board members and also, you know, really active volunteers, particularly if they're retired, but you need to distinguish those roles. And that's really important because, you know, if you're trying to diversify your board, you're trying to bring on younger people with families, you're trying to diversify your audience base, your donor base, you really need to think about the role of the board and expectations. So, you know, you want to think about distinguishing between the committees of the corporation that are those standing committees and maybe some of those work groups or task forces. Um, what are time delineated short term. This group is going to meet for three months. It's going to do the this event or this program um, series and then they're going to disband until next year. Um, and then, you know, you can also combine various activities. So if you're super small, there's no reason the executive committee can't also be the finance and personnel committee, right? Um, that it's not a lot there. You have the president and the treasurer who are usually on the finance committee anyway. If your budget is, you know, really small, um, you're not complex, you don't have a lot of, um, you know, just need for, for expertise around investments or those kinds of things. Some organizations put together their resource development or fundraising and board development because it's really about, you know, maybe it's a human resources committee. It looks at volunteers as resources. It looks at uh, staff, if you have them as resources, board members as resources. Um, you know, so, or some have a human resources that combine board development and personnel. You can combine maybe collections and exhibits. Um, depending on your organization, just be creative about it. Particularly if you find that it's the same people on multiple committees, can they, you know, instead of people having to go to uh, three or four different meetings every month, can they combine into one and again be very intentional about the agenda for those meetings. Uh, looks like there uh, is one question here. Okay, so when you reference a chartered institution, do you need only organizations chartered by the Board of Regents? Would these organizations need to have an audit committee? I do mean those that are chartered by the Board of Regents and yes, they need to have an audit committee. It's unique to the, um, to the Board of Regents, the Board of Ed. You, you, um, chartered institutions need to have an, a separate audit committee, um, whereas the not-for-profit corporation law itself does not require a separate committee um, for the audit committee. And in most organizations, unless they're super large or complex, it's not recommended. There was a misunderstanding that Sarbanes-Oxley years ago required folks to have a separate audit committee, but that's not accurate. Okay, so a few things around making committees work. Don't meet if there's no work to do, right? They need a compelling reason to meet. They need a goal and a purpose for the meeting itself and a context within the larger organization's work. So not every committee, committee needs to meet every month, for instance. Some might need to meet more actively certain periods of the year leading up to the nominating process, for instance, for new board members, or leading up to a major event, or if you're a seasonal organization, you know, the planning of your season um, for several months before, but maybe a few months after, besides a debrief, there's not a lot of work that needs to be done. I know many organizations have a lot of snowbirds on their boards and don't necessarily meet, you know, in the winter or don't meet as much in the summer. Um, but so I think part of it is, is really thinking strategically about the workload 
uh, and when that needs to happen. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. You want to make sure that committees are clear about their goals and their purpose and why they exist and that you have either or both good staff and board leadership for them. For the committee chairs to know what needs to happen, um, how to run a meeting, that they understand what the goals of the meeting are or the issues involved in whatever's on the agenda. So there needs to be some planning for committees. It can't just be show up and then decide, right? That the agenda not only needs to be developed, but it also needs to be well thought out. Also, particularly for committees that, um, you know, do some of the more operational work or advisory work to staff, you really want to make sure that they're not micromanaging staff, um, that they aren't micromanaging the organization, that their task is clear, their scope is clear, that they're not getting lost in the weeds. And, and it's sort of within the broader context of committees are a really great way of sort of leveraging uh, organizational policy and day-to-day -day operations and figuring out what happens in the middle in terms of developing a plan for action, coordinating things, um, and moving an agenda forward. But it's important to note that committees do not supervise staff, right? Committees have no di di direction that committees need to make a recommendation back to the board, and then the board essentially would tell the executive director what to do in terms of the overall priorities. So just, you know, important for the committee to understand that it doesn't have any authority to assign work to staff, um, whether it's the executive director or support staff. Uh, you want to make sure that committees make timely and action-oriented reports to the board. So what I would suggest is that for committees that are directly accountable to the board, right, like a finance committee or a board development or a fundraising committee, that each of those committees take and distribute minutes into the entire board prior to the meeting as part of the meeting packet. That the, the board should be expected to read the minutes and the reports, right? If you're talking about the more operationally focused committees, so those committees that perhaps are event specific or facilities specific, that if you have an executive director, that it really comes to the board through the executive director's report. Um, and that they focus on those issues that are important for the board to know strategically. What's important is that the board really understands and respects the committee's work and process and does not repeat committee work at the meetings. You want committees, you know, you want the committee to make a recommendation or provide information or do certain things and report back to the board. But if the board starts having the same conversation that the committee had, it really needs to be stopped by the chairperson, right? That that, if, if people are interested in being involved in the committee discussions, make your committee meetings open to all board members. That's perfectly fine. Um, or assign someone to a committee but you don't want to repeat that work. And that's part of making your committees effective and efficient so that you don't get hijacked by the day-to-day -day operations, um, that you really focus at the board meeting in a more effective and efficient way, and that you don't really discourage committees by you know, not respecting the work that they've done. 
if the board does not like, right? So if a committee makes a recommendation to the board in terms of, uh, you know, an event or who it wants to honor or a collections policy or whatever it might be, and the board is having a conversation that clearly shows it does not think that it's a good idea. And it, you know, decides to say, okay, we're going to send that recommendation to the finance committee for an analysis or in order to feel comfortable with that investment policy recommendation, we need some additional information. Let's speak to legal counsel. Can you speak to them and bring back that information to us at the next meeting? That's perfectly fine. Or the board can vote not to accept a committee's recommendation and decide what other course of action to take and how to, you know, reassign it to a committee or a different committee or give the committee guidance on doing it. But you don't want to repeat committee work at board meetings. Committees are a really great way of building leadership and educating board members and engaging board members. So Think if you've got someone who you're, you know, cultivating for a leadership position in the organization, put them on the board development committee one year, put them on the finance committee next year, put them on the collections committee the year after that, that gives them a broad understanding of the organization so that when they become, you know, vice president or president or treasurer, they understand the organization and its fullness and its complexity. Um, okay, this is just a sample calendar that you can put together that kind of speaks to when things need to get done. This is just an example, obviously. But, you know, if your fiscal year starts in October, you know, you know, and you've got your board meetings listed. You can put the dates in if you know it's the second, you know, Tuesday of every month at three o'clock or whatever it is, whatever the date is. You know, and if you've got a seasonal, this is a seasonal group, you approve ticket prices. You know that the finance committee needs to, um, you know, establish the audit committee, that the program committee needs to, um, you know, announce its draft season schedule for the following year that the membership committee is going to develop its plans for a year-end appeal um, and newsletter. And essentially what this does is it, it creates a structure and a framework so that your committees know what they need to present to the board, what's coming up, what their priorities are within an overall organizational context. You can also, if you have a strategic plan, you can also take those dates from your strategic plan and put them into this overall organizational calendar as well. So that, you know, at every board meeting, you review the calendar and then you can sort of say, okay, it's at our October meeting, this is what we did. Coming up next month, we expect the board development committee to do a board member orientation. Um, you know, we expect the membership committee to give us a draft of the year end to mail the draft a year end appeal. So every there's accountability and there's communication and there's transparency within the organization. And there's just comprehensive feedback loops between all of the committees and the board. Okay, a couple of thoughts on the committee chair responsibilities. So, you know, committee, like I mentioned earlier, committee chairs are largely under supported. You want them to recommend to the president and the board who they would like to see serve on their committees, perhaps. Committee chairs should be able to, you know, take responsibility and initiative for calling meetings and setting the agenda they should know the goals and outcomes for that meeting. They probably should speak to the, you know, executive director or board president before each meeting to have some support or guidance around that, or maybe the vice president. They want to make sure that the minutes are being taken for the meeting. Just want to clarify also, 
committees of the board are legally required to take minutes. Executive committees must take minutes. It is strongly advised that all committees take minutes, even if they're just notes, if it's very operational, you know, like I said, it can go into the ED's report or it can just be a quick update briefing to the board at the next, in a written capacity at the next board meeting so that you aren't, you know, you, what you don't want to have happen is for board members to be re meet, reading the minutes of committee meetings or board me minutes at the board meeting or committee members doing that. They should go out to committee members in advance that you sh if people are committing to carrying out certain responsibilities, it should say, you know, Dan agreed to reach out to uh, the liquor store and request a case of wine for the event. Uh, you know, and, and be very clear, oops, about what's, uh, you know, what people want to um, have committed to doing. So there's a, a see a chat. Um, how does all this change in the age of Zoom? Good question. Um, it doesn't, um, except that you're using Zoom. One thing I just, I, I think, uh, for meetings is Zoom has a great feature of chat. What I sometimes do in the chat box as I'm going through a meeting is take my notes and minutes in the chat box and you can download, either set your Zoom to kind of go through and save it all uh, automatically or you can just intentionally save your chat and there's your minutes um, right then and there. So, uh, or at least the, the bases of them. Um, you know, I think engaging people via Zoom, it's, it, it's certainly a different approach, it's a different set of skills, but my experience is that organizations have largely adapted very quickly. Um, you know, you need to do, if you haven't gotten your board on board with this or committee members on board with this, you need to do some training. You obviously need to look at, um, you know, just making sure that people have the technology that they need. Certainly in rural areas, there are people who don't have very good internet service. You know, you obviously need to think about those kinds of issues, but um, within the, the scope of your control, there's a lot that you can do remotely um, and be successful. And we're seeing organizations really resilient in adapting um, to that. Uh, I think, um, so the committee chair needs to be a good facilitator, um, providing some training or support to people around that, knowing, you know, Robert's rules or uh, consensus decision making or whatever your organization uses, um, helping people understand how to move forward, how to deal with different difficult people. Uh, all of those things are, you know, really important in supporting effective committee chairs because committee chairs can't manage the group, it, particularly if you've got, you know, members or just uh, unruly people who dominate the conversation, um, they need to be able and comfortable to say to somebody, you know, Jane, thanks really for your input. We're going to ask other people for their ideas, you know, or what in the, you know, in the, in the essence of time, why don't you go ahead and type that thought into the chat box and we can consider, come back to it at a later date. Um, so managing that is really important. Um, if your board, if your committee has staff assigned to it, whether it's the executive director or if you've got a development director who staffs the fundraising committee or a, um, you know, a bookkeeper or finance director who staffs the finance committee, you want to make sure you're coordinating the communication and staffing services with, with the executive director as well as with the assigned staff person. Um, you want to make sure that the committee chairs are expected to report the recommendations from the committee, 
uh, progress, uh, other significant issues or concerns. I think, you know, when, and this is, if you've got a committee chair, for instance, who's not calling meetings or doing what they're supposed to do, and so instead of not putting it on the board agenda, right, put it on the board agenda and expect it. And at the committee, you know, at the board meeting, if the committee chair you know, isn't there or called to be accountable, someone else needs to be assigned to step up and step in and either work with and support the, the, the first committee chair or take their place, right? It's the responsibility of the full board to make sure that committee chairs are able and willing and capable of running the meetings and moving those forward um, committee chairs need to engage the members, reach out to their members as well if people aren't coming. You know, they need to be good communicators. Um, you also want to make sure that the committee chairs keep the board president or board chair apprised of all committee progress. Um, you know, let the president know about the committee's report in advance, how much time they will need on the agenda, what information or input they would like from the board members themselves. Um, the committee chair needs to make sure that the committee stays within its charge, right, and that it doesn't kind of go outside of that charge or do things that it doesn't have the authority to do. Um, it needs to focus the conversation and the agenda. And it, the committee chair also needs to make sure that if the committee is having conversations that essentially are recommendations for operational or staff issues, that they need to be very clear that it's not a directive, it's not a supervisory comment in any way. That's particularly important if you've got, you know, a collections committee that's working with your curator, they aren't really the, they're not the, the, the supervisor of the curator, it's the executive director is. So that's where, you know, the communication flow, again, from the committees to the board, to the executive director, get aligned in a way that are clear and everybody understands who's accountable to whom and in what ways. So just in summary, um, you want to make sure that you define the authority of the committees, any limitations of the committee. You want to define what kind of committee is it? Committee of the board, committee of the corporation. Who serves on this committee? You know, what role do board members play? What role do members or experts play? If you've got staff involved, what is their role, right? Making it very clear that staff are staffing the committee, not voting members of the committee, for instance. And you want that in your bylaws. You want to think about appointing non-board members to your committees, if your bylaws allow, um, and ensuring that they understand whether they're advisory or voting. Having non-board members increases your numbers, right? You can have a committee or a work group or a task force with one board member and six members, you know, from your membership. Um, you can have a committee that's three board members and, you know, two members or two experts or whatever it might be. Um, and that's perfectly fine. You just want to be clear with them whether they're advisory or voting. You want to make sure that you respect people's time. There's nothing more frustrating than committees um, or board meetings that go awry, right? So you want to have good ground rules for communication. You want to have good agendas. You want to make sure your meetings are run well and that time is managed well. You know, your committee meetings should not be any more than uh, you know, an hour and a half or two hours at the most. Um, you want to make sure that you build organizational infrastructure. And so think about a routine meeting schedule, right? Know in advance 
when your standing committees need to meet. That goes back to that calendar that I just showed you. But the, you know, it shouldn't be, okay, committee, when are we gonna meet next time, right? Let's meet the second Tuesday of every month or um, you know, whatever it might be. So that there's a structure. You wanna make sure that calendar ties to major organizational events to your strategic plan, to important deadlines, such as when your 990 or your audit or your grant deadlines are due. You should review your committee structure and its effectiveness annually and think about, excuse me, redefining its responsibilities on a periodic basis. Sometimes committees grow in their, just like jobs, they grow in their scope so big that they're not feasible and maybe you need to set, you know, set up a different committee or um, you need to take off some of those responsibilities or you need to really realign what your committees are doing with organizational capacity. You need to find new board members. One thing that can be really helpful is to assign the vice president or vice chair the responsibility of supporting committee chairs this is a really good way of grooming them. It alleviates some of the responsibility from the president or the chairperson. Um, you know, and it gives the vice president or vice chair something tangible to do um, it, as, a, as a responsibility. And I think one thing that's really important is that you make committee service an expectation of board service, that all board members are expected to serve on at least one committee. And so you're communicating that in a board job description, you're communicating that to prospective board members, and you're holding people accountable to that. So if they're not able to meet that expectation, you can ask them to free up a seat in order to uh, make room for someone else. So there's a couple of questions um, that I'm just gonna read out. Um, how typical is it for the board, the president of the board to appoint committee members um, or chairs, or is that typically not done as, or typically done as a board? So, you know, there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. I, I would say nothing should be done unilaterally, right? The, the, the job of the board president, right, is to figure out how to best utilize the team members of the board. So they should, um, you know, they should certainly be involved in that. Often what we recommend is that the board development committee think about uh, the assignments of different committee members. And that's a good way of really thinking about it within a broader context of leadership development and secession planning. Um, it, you know, you want to think about who's going to be a good committee chairperson, certainly in consultation with the board president, if the board president isn't on that committee, um, and certainly in consultation with uh, the, the recommended committee chair. You know, the one thing I would say that is not a good idea is just a unilateral, I mean, I think it's good to ask people, what committees might you be interested in? But you don't want to just do a sort of, okay, who's interested in the board development committee and if people raise their hand and those are the people. You want to do it in a much more intentional way because you want to make sure that there's a diversity of understanding and perspective and that you're, you're thoughtful about the participants because it's that group that's going to do the work and you want to make sure that they, that even your, um, you know, your collections committee understands how collections and programs relate to one another or how it's tied to fundraising. And you want people with different thoughts about that um, on the committee. Um, there's also a question about, is it standard to have the president or chair ex officio on all committees? It is, definitely. Um, you know, I think what one thing you want to do is specify whether they're ex officio voting or non voting. Um, you know, and if they're not attending meetings on a regular basis, they may not, you know, that's a lot of committees to be part of. Um, but I would say, you know, that in some ways, all 
all board members should be invited to participate in committees if they're interested, even if they're not an appointed voting member of that committee. Um, so I think, you know, what I would say is, is that there should be some communication. Certainly the board, the president is responsible for making the team um, work and that doing that in conjunction with an overall organizational strategy for board development and secession planning uh, is important, whether that's done by the executive committee, the nominating committee, or the board development committee. Um, so feel free if you have other questions. Here's just a couple of resources that might be useful. Um, the first one is just a good resource that I found on utilizing committees. The second one is more for all volunteer organizations. Um, certainly, if you're looking for various uh, templates, like that calendar, you know, I can share that, something like that with you when we send out the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll just give people a couple of minutes. If you want to type in any additional follow-up questions, feel free. Um, if not, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure to have you all here. I hope this has been helpful. Um, and if there's any additional information or resources we can provide, you know, just let us know. Uh, uh, we will, we will follow, yes, we will follow, send the resources. We'll send the PowerPoint to you. Oh, one thought that I just want to um, suggest to you, and I do this at all of my trainings, is you're all here on this webinar. At your next board meeting, send this out in advance and ask for 15 minutes on the agenda and point out the things that you feel are most useful for your organization. You know, what are your three takeaways? Um, and share that with your fellow board members. So, you know, so that this isn't just something that you hold on to, but that your board can actually uh, engage with and incorporate. All right, well, for all of you, thank you so much. And um, not seeing any further questions, it's, um, so I'll go ahead and end the session. And uh, ooh, looks like there might be, so thank you all very much.